Man, I feel like God is like doing some good stuff today, right? Y'all feel it? There's some days you come into church and you're like, whoo, let's go, you know? And I feel like today's one of those days uh, where God just is moving in the room and and it's, it's weird because like you can just hear, it's like I just know that there's some things going on. And really one of the things that we were praying about this morning about this particular message, we're in our fourth week in the book of James. Um, if you are not accustomed to the book of James, just know you will be offended at some point in time in this message. Uh, just chalk that up the Holy Spirit. It's not me, okay? I'm your friend. We're in good terms, you know? But the book of James doesn't mess around. Um, and today, I, I feel like as we were praying into this morning, um, the intercessory team was feeling like there are a couple things. One is that you need to understand uh, there's going to be a spiritual and divine shift in your thinking. Like God is moving in your mind today to help you to come into alignment with what the Bible says as to how we should live our life. And the things that may have felt like a, a hardship and a toil are, are going to come into alignment and you're actually going to be excited to do this. I actually think of it just in my mind just now. I'm thinking about like, you ever, you ever met kids at Christmas time? None of them want to give gifts. They want to receive gifts. But a maturity says, man, I can't wait till I can give a gift. And this, because it was a mind shift. Like there was something in your mind and your heart and your spirit that shifted. And I think we as Christ followers in this room this, today, we're going to experience that kind of spiritual maturity and that shift so that we can walk out of this place today being more like Jesus. That is the ultimate goal, to be more like Jesus. And the other part is, I think, is that because one, one piece is that it's Father's Day, but that it's, it's also because like the Father's heart for you is so good. It says that the goodness of God leads us to repentance, right? And it's the goodness of God. And I think sometimes we've gotten into this place where it's like the holy conviction of the pastor leads you to conviction, and that's not true. It is actually the goodness of God. It is the, is the graciousness of God that, that wants me to go lay myself down because he first laid himself down. He first loved us and so we can love him in return. And so today, with this in mind, if you, if you are willing to receive this word, which you're in here, so you're telling me a hearty yes, um, I want you to stand up with me. I'm gonna read in the book of James over us and we're gonna pray into this morning and get into this. James chapter one, verse 22 through 27. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. And there's a repeat that you don't see there that I'm going to do for us. It's a hidden piece in the text that says, read it again. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Say it with me. Do what it says. I'm going to keep reading now. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be, what's that word? Blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves, and the religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. So Father God, we stand in awe of your goodness today. And I know that today your spirit is moving in our hearts and our minds to help us to come into alignment and to agree with what the word of God says. Lord, we thank you for James. We thank you that he sat down and, and he wrote this, that the spirit was moving through James so that it would be so relevant to us today. And God, I pray that your spirit would move in our hearts today, that you would uh, keep the enemy from trying to bring shame or condemnation on us from a strong word, but that it would be the gracious and the goodness of God that would, uh, that would move in our lives and bring us into alignment with what you have to say today. In Jesus' name, everybody says, amen. You can have a seat. On November the 20th of 1954, Clementine Churchill, that's Winston Churchill's wife, she received a painting from a gentleman who had painted this beautiful painting of her husband on his birthday towards the end of his life. You can see this painting here. Um, so she sees this painting of her husband and she has this to say, it's really quite alarmingly like him. Now, if you've ever received a portrait of yourself, not the one by a bridge in like a big town where they, it's a character. I'm talking about like they painted you, right? You ever looked at an image of yourself and somebody snapped a photo? Some people go like, man, that just looks like you're like, I just don't see it. You ever, you ever had that before? Well, that's, that's weird because Churchill goes and he looks at this painting. The one that his wife says, that is just like you. And he had two words, malignant and filthy. 
He did not like this painting. He goes on later and he destroys this painting. What I think is interesting is Churchill was a man of words. They said that he actually weaponized the English language to combat against the Nazis. So he knew words. He was, he was a craftsman when it came to words. And the word malignant is interesting. That was a, a word, it's a Latin from the 16th century that actually means likely to rebel against God and authority. So I think when he's using that word about himself, he probably sees something and speaks into it, something he just probably didn't quite you know, want everybody to know that this man is likely to rebel against God and he's kind of filthy here, all right, y'all? So he could see himself and those were the words that he gave. Like Churchill looking at himself though, what do you see in yourself? In the movie Titanic, Rose, the older woman who goes onto that new ship because they're, they're researching that Titanic. They had gone into her room from long ago and they pulled out a bunch of um, old things in her room and, and they laid them out. So when she came in and she's frail and she's looking at them and she's like, oh my gosh, these are just like the day I remember them. And she picks up her mirror, she turns it over and she says, the reflection has changed a bit. And I think about us and this word that we're gonna get into today. That how often do we look at ourselves in the mirror and actually take just a moment to look at what's looking back. Do you actually know who you are? Do you live into the person that you hope to be? So that when you look at yourself, you say, yes, I am living the life of who I hope to be. And ultimately, as a Christ follower, we want to be like Jesus. When you read the text in the message, it says, those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are and what they look like. And church, I think often we've come so far in our ability to research and dig into the gospel. There's so many messages. You You could listen to a message every single day for the rest of your life, and it could probably be a new preacher that you found on YouTube. We have found so many ways to share the gospel and yet we are still in this place in our life where no one will actually live the gospel, right? We've gotten so commonplace as a church to go and love and worship Jesus on a Sunday morning and go live like what we want to outside the church. In other words, we spend our worship time in here two minutes later when we sit down at the restaurant, we forgot who we are. I was a waiter at Applebee's. I don't know if that makes me much of a waiter, but it makes me a waiter. And when I worked at Applebee's, you know what was the worst crowd to serve? the Sunday morning church crowd. It was hands down the word. And it wasn't like just my experience. If you've ever been a waiter or waitress and you didn't like the Sunday crowd, give me a little like, "Mm mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, why? Uh, Two reasons. One, they were typically the rudest and had the highest demands and they tipped the worst. That that is the worst. I was like, man, love y'all too. You know, a bunch of Christian loving on each other. Like, I don't know what it is about going and having church, but that two minute drive, wherever it may be, you just lost who you are in that process. You showed up at the restaurant and you're just like, oh man, I may have encountered heaven, but I'm gonna live like hell here for a little while, right? Like it's just, and then it just, that's how it started and it'll continue that way until all of a sudden Sunday night, you're like, oh, let's have church. You're like, you know, listen, I'm hoping that this word that James has given us, James gives a word, not me, right? James is given the word, I'm preaching it. The James word here, this word in the Bible is so strong for us to realize that when you look at yourself in the mirror, you have to recognize who is looking back at you and hopefully it's gonna be Jesus that you may see yourself, but in your soul and in your heart and in your mind and the way that you live, it should be Jesus looking right back at you. You shouldn't look in the mirror, see yourself and go like, malignant and filthy, but it looks just like me. Who are you becoming? And are you a a reflection of what you want to see? In 2 Corinthians, as Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, he says this, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory. In other words, man, we are looking at Jesus and it says, what happens after that? Once you've taken away the veil, once you've stepped into salvation, once you're fixing your eyes, it says this, that we are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the spirit. In other words, when you said yes to Jesus and you received the day of salvation and you began to fix your eyes on Jesus, from that moment forward, you became more and more like Jesus and ever increasing glory. You are being transformed into the image of God. That's pretty cool. But are you being transformed into the image of God? Not like are we collectively, are people in the world, 
I want us to stop right now and I want you to think about it. Are you being transformed into the image of God in your daily life? If not, what is the image you're being shaped into? Are you allowing your life and your decisions to mold you to be a person of Christ? If not, it could be that you're being deceived. And yes, you know who we love to blame? Who do we love to blame, church? The devil. The devil gets blamed for everything. He's the deceiver, he's the liar, he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And in every situation, we love to blame the devil. Yet the problem that James is talking about has nothing to do with the devil, it has to do with you. You are now the great deceiver of yourself. Why? Because you began to hear the word, but didn't want to be a doer of the word. James chapter 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, the New American Standard, the way it puts it, says, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. We delude ourselves when we believe. When I read the scripture and I go, man, that was great. I'm just gonna keep on doing what I'm doing. For as long as I can remember, Christians have chosen to hear the word, walk away, and not do the word. It's just what happens. Someone, now a Christian is this person. It's someone whose behavior and heart reflects Jesus Christ. That's what a Christian is. We love labels though, right? It's easy just to throw a label on something. I'm a Christian. What does that mean? Well, it means I go to church. It means I believe in Jesus. And it means that I go to church. Okay. Well, the actual word Christian actually came as kind of a derogatory term. Christian actually back a long time ago meant little Jesuses. And they were like, yeah, a bunch of little Jesus think you know what you're doing. And they're like, thank you, we are Christians now. But imagine, what, what, what is it that those people are trying to convey? If they're making fun of us, saying you're just a bunch of Christians, you're trying to be like Jesus, be like, that's, that's an honor, yes, thank you. You're getting what I'm trying to throw down here. I'm trying to live like Jesus. What would the world say about us if they were gonna they say something? Probably not that. If they were looking, if somebody really looked at your life right now and they said, oh, you're acting like what? A lot of times I've had this one happen where they're like, they basically say, you're acting like the world, but you're claiming Jesus. And you talk about a road bump in your witness when you're like, you know, talking to somebody and they're like, you don't act nothing like Jesus people. I've had that said to me, not lately, because I'm growing and maturing in my faith. But there have been times early in my walk where I didn't live out my Christian faith with everybody. You got some of those people that you're like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not inviting them to church, but I'll go with them somewhere. There's a lot of hmms. Okay, we might mean to preach on that one later. We'll get, we'll get better. <laughs> but how you act is gonna show everyone around you if you're a Christ follower. If you're a little Jesus on earth reflecting him. We're supposed to be a doer of the word and we've got to stop deluding ourselves. The goal of deception is, is so that someone who wants to identify as Christ, this is where it comes in, is that I want to identify him, but I don't live the life. I don't have the parts in my life to be a Christian. You're deceiving yourself. You claim something you're unwilling to actually live. That's not fair. It's not fair to you and it's not fair to anyone else. Who's doing the deceiving? You are. You are deceiving yourself. The devil didn't have to do it. You heard the word and thought, that's too much. I don't want that. You hear the call into faith, but the idea of giving all of you to the call seems too much of a cost. So we allow ourselves to be deceived. We've replaced relationship with information. That's a a hard place to be in. And this morning, I want us to just, we're gonna have moments of reflection. This whole book is about reflecting and meditating and sitting, sitting, sitting and settling on the things of God. And in our life, we have to ask, have I replaced a relationship with Jesus with just gaining more information? Do I come to church to know more about God or do I come to church to have a life-changing encounter with him, to really allow for him to move and impact the actual decisions that I'm gonna make on a Monday and a Tuesday and a Wednesday? Am I going to allow for what I read in the scriptures to hear in these scriptures to really shape the way that I'm living so that people around me go like, I can tell this person is a Christian. We replaced the way of living with Christ for Bible studies. Hear me on this. Like we, we've covered over like a, a way of life with just going to a Bible study. 
or we'll have daily devotions traded for weekly services. Like instead of doing it every day and learning and, and growing, we just know I go to a Sunday service. Or maybe obedience gets laid down for convenience. That's easy to do. It's so much easier to not be a Christian. Amen? Amen? It is. Don't, don't deceive anybody. It's hard. It's hard to live out your faith. It's hard to actually be a Christ follower at all times. When people invite you out to the movies and you're like, I can't watch that one. And you know they're gonna make fun of you. When you walk up at work and people are gossiping and talking about somebody and you wanna walk up in that circle and you hear it, you think, I should probably leave. But you know what? This is really interesting. I have something to pray for. We were on vacation and there was a person who was very sick and laying next to the pool, little cabana and a little drink and everything. And they're just laying there and they got like a patch on. You could tell they were frail. And we were thinking like, is this like a make a wish thing? Like, cause this person's not doing good. And our first thought was like, oh, Jesus might have us go over there and pray for the healing of this person at a pool in front of everybody. And I was like, oh Lord, don't, it's vacation. <laughs> I'm repenting now in front of all of you. That was my first thought. Lord, I do ministry a lot. Like, can you just, can you just like not have me go over there for this one? That's pretty sad. It's pretty sad for all of us. Like when we live that kind of a lifestyle, I wanna live the way I wanna live and I don't, re- I wanna have a relationship with Jesus, but I don't want it like that, right? Those, those are the wild Christians, the crazy ones, you know? Now I want you to stop for a second. I want you to think back. I want you to think back for a second to the day you got saved. Like if you need to close your eyes and think, we're gonna sit for just a second because you've got to get this piece so we can keep moving forward. Think back to the day that you gave your life to Jesus a week ago, a year ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Think back on that day right now. Just imagine, put yourself back in that place. Has your life radically changed since that day? From the day you walked down the aisle, to the day you prayed with a pastor or a leader, are you more like Jesus every day since that moment? Or do you not really see that much of a change since that moment? I hope you recognize that the moment of salvation you are radically changed. So much so that the Bible talks about how you have died to yourself and you are resurrected a new person. That means when you have salvation, the day of your salvation, you should look back and go, I am a completely different person. From these days, salvation, completely different. They don't even know me. I love meeting some of you around here because your past is horrid. (laughs) But the person I know is not that person. They, I've heard so many stories from so many people. I was like, there's no way that's you. They're like, yeah, for real. And you're like, I don't know that person. I'll literally say, I don't know that person. The only one I know is this one. I have got to experience people receiving salvation and watching their literal faces change. You know, in the physical, you change because of the spiritual. Like, it's like they are a new person. And then I'm like, man, they used to be a rough person, but now they are phenomenal. Crazy what has changed. Their marriage. You, I, listen, you know what I love? I love it when people come in and I know people's stories and like, I want a marriage like so-and-so. And you're like, ha, you have no clue what it took to get to that point. You're not even close to where they used to be. Now, I'd never say that. Confidentiality, you know what I mean? But I say, yes, they have an amazing marriage. But what I love, what I'm trying to get at is that Jesus radically changes you. You are no, that person is literally dead, buried with Jesus, resurrected anew in the spirit. You're a new person. So again, as we're hearing some things in the room that you're like, ooh, I'm starting to feel conviction. You know what? It's probably the Holy Spirit going like, bury that. You take that part of your flesh and you bury it so deep you'll never see it again. And then you just get resurrected to the love and the goodness of Jesus Christ. And you're like, I can live from that place? Yes. And then when you look in the mirror, all you see is Jesus. That's the message, but we're just working our way through it, okay? So here's the deal. Think back. I was married 19 years ago to Erica. 19 years ago, I walked down the aisle. I got all dressed up. She actually said yes. I gave her a ring. We stood in front of our friends and our families. And I was like, I choose you till death do us part. 
but what would happen if I did not radically transform that day at that altar when I gave my life to just be with Erica? What if I continued to live my lifestyle before? A couple of weekends go by, I go on a date. I met a girl on an app and I said, hey, we should go on a date. So I go, I take her out to the movies. We see Top Gun, great movie. You know what I mean? Yes, yeah, so it's taking me back. We go to the movies. I hold her hand. I get her some popcorn and a Coke. We're just having a good time, laughing. <laughs> hold a little pinky. We walk out, you know. I'm holding hands. I drive her home. I take her up to the dress up. I give her a kiss. Oh, it was a great date. I'll see you later. She goes home. A couple of weeks later, I meet another girl and I'm like, we should have children. All of a sudden, I go back home and Erica's like, huh? I'm like, babe. I chose you. I walked down the aisle. I gave you a ring. I confessed in front of everybody that I love you, but I'm just, I just, the person that I was, that's just who I am. I continue to live that same lifestyle. You see where I'm going with this? How have we treated Jesus like this? You you know, in the scriptures, Jesus used the, the analogy of marriage over and over and over again because when you accepted Jesus Christ, you, you became the bride of Christ and married into the family. And yet we continue to be like prostitutes cheating on our husband all the time in the world. We're, we're choosing the things of this world. We're choosing anything that will make us happy and we're leaving Jesus at the church saying, I'll see you again on Sunday. That's literally what it's like for every little white lie, every piece of gossip. I'm not talking about the heavy stuff we like to throw stones at yet. I'm just talking about the sins the church is really good at committing. That's literally what it's like for us to do. Your actions speak louder than your words. Now, Erica would not have said that. She would probably shot me at the the first place I went to. If you know my wife, there would have been gunshots fired. Everybody's safe, but I... Cue it up. I'm, it's funeral time. You know what I mean? I'm out. <laughs> but there's common language early in the church about not loving the things of the world. And, and now we actually don't even understand what that's like because it's become so ingrained in the world that we live in. Right? Because you can see this. The culture of the world has invaded every aspect of our life. And when, I, when I'm talking about the culture of the world, I'm talking about like what chooses like a collective value that the world chooses what we should value. You know this, every time you turn the TV on, they're showing you what you should value, correct? And it's our political systems. It, it's our value systems. It's our worldly vanities, the things that we should buy and purchase to make. How many of you can actually go to Target and not spend $100, right? The worldly, va- you know, this advantage. You walk in there and you're like, they're showing you everything you need to buy right now. And then they're tricking us, trying to get it. They're playing music to get you to shop more, you know? And it's like, we should spend our time and money and relationships on these. That's what the world is telling you what to do. And yet the gospel says, let's live completely against the culture of the world and establish our own culture as the kingdom in this world but we've allowed for ourselves to live in the world and also be of the world. First John two says this, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the father is not in them. Hang on. The church loves to tell you, like I say church, just in general, I'm trying to, you know, like really hurt you and also pick you back up again. We're really working on this today. Okay. Like let's just really get in. What does the text say? It says, don't love the world or anything in the world. In other words, when we're singing a song, I don't need anyone or anything. I just need Jesus. That's what it's saying. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. What you're saying is it's like that marriage that you keep going away from. It's because you're saying, Jesus, you know I love you, but I really love all this stuff. And he's like, if you loved me, you would not love the world. And he goes on and says, for everything in the world, Everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The lust of flesh, that's the sexual desires. It's food and drink. It's that instant gratification, that control over the things that crave you or that that leads to cravings. The lust of eyes are like greed and envy and jealousy and discontent. And then you look at the pride of life. That's my way. That's my timing. I'm gonna rebel against the authority. I know what's best for my life. That's what the world wants you to choose is what's best for you. Do you, right? But the call of Jesus is to die to the love of the world and replace it with a culture of heaven in your life. It is a divine surrender into the way of Jesus. So where are we at so far right now? Where are we at? We become what we love. 
What you truly love, what you choose to be with, spend time with, is what you become. And we give ourselves over to the deception because the idea of dying to myself was just too much for Jesus. It's just too much for, for that. I, I, I thank you, Jesus, for salvation, but obedience is just too much. We've basically asked to have the kingdom without the king. We've asked for blessing without the blesser. We've asked God to be friends with benefits because we don't want a marriage with dedication. And we want salvation without obedience, but you can't have salvation without obedience. They're the same thing. I'm not the only one who sees it this way. There's a theologian, his name is Douglas Moo. He says this, those who fail to do the word, who merely listen to the word, are guilty of a dangerous and potentially fatal self-delusion. If the gospel by nature contains both saving power and summons to obedience, those who relate to only its saving side have not truly embraced the gospel. We want to do what makes us happy and at the same time have the approval of God, don't we? We want heaven on our terms. James has tried to show us what does that really look like? If you're trying to do this on your own, if you're trying to do it, just you're hearing the word, you're deluding yourself, what is that like? It's where he uses the mirror analogy now. So let's look at it. James 1, 23 and 24. It says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. We would call that person pretty dumb. Like how did you just... You know who you are. You just look at yourself. How did you forget who you are? James 1, it's, it's right there, it says that when we look into his natural face, when we look into our face, that word there is a Greek word that's called Genesis. What is that? That's your beginning, right? It's, it's that, that, that point in a specific place in your life where you were birthed, you were new. Because here's the deal. When you think of this in light of 2 Corinthians 5, it says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. So when you are a Christ follower, you open up that mirror and you look at yourself. When you are taking an inventory of yourself, you realize the dead person is gone and buried. That new person, the genesis of my salvation has created the new and that's what I see. I don't see sin. I don't I don't see shame. That's what the devil wants me to see. That's removed. I see the blood of Christ that covers me. I am a new creation. Now that's a good place to live from. That's what we see staring back at ourselves. So are you living as that new creation? Thinking on your life right now, my day of salvation the day that I got saved, I gave my life to Jesus. I remember I walked down the aisle. I met the pastor and I told him I need to pray for salvation. I prayed. A few weeks later, they put me in some water. I went down. I came back up and I continued to live the same life from that moment forward. But I did sprinkle in a little bit of Jesus. That's why I've said this before and I hate this. It's like, it, like people who say like, uh, not people, t-shirts. I'm put it that way so we don't offend anybody. If you don't, hope you don't have a t-shirt. It says, I'm a Christian, but I cuss a little. That's like, I'm a husband, but I cheat a little. It's like, that doesn't work. That doesn't work. Like, you, you can't do that. It's like, I'm on a diet, but I eat fried chicken and mashed potatoes for every meal. No. Not unless you're like 13. But we all do the same thing. We go, that's going to catch up with you. Don't we? Because we know. John Calvin says that obedience is the mother of true knowledge of God. That if you want to know God, obey God. You really want to be with God? Obey God. Obey his commands. And, in, and Jesus literally talks about this. He says that in John 14, he says, if you love me, keep my commands. This is what Jesus says. If you love me. So you're standing up there with the bridegroom. You are the bride. He's the groom. And he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. Then he says this. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So I'll know if you're a Christ follower. You know how? Do you obey what the word of God says? Or do you not obey what the word of God says? You're like, yeah, but I'm a Christian. I don't care what you label yourself. In Matthew, it talks about in the end times, we're gonna get before Jesus. And some of us are gonna say, look at all the things that I did, Jesus. And he says, I don't know you. That word to know is to have an intimate relationship with a person. He's like, I don't intimately know you. You know about me, just like all of us know about Bieber. <laughs> We've never met and hung out with him. We've seen Kanye on TV. We don't know him. How many of us have that same relationship with Jesus? I've read about him. I've heard the preacher talk about him. I don't actually know this Jesus you're talking about. But I labeled myself a Christian because it makes me feel good on the insides. 
This means we're gonna do what he says. What, is, what does the Bible say? I'll list off a few things. So you get, when he says, do what I've asked, you know, like, if you love me, you're gonna do this. This is what it says in the scriptures. There's just a few. You're gonna love one another. You're gonna be mature and complete in your faith. You're gonna love God and put no others before him. You're gonna be generous. You're gonna pray for the sick. You're gonna share the gospel. You're gonna rid yourself of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. You're gonna repent. You're gonna rejoice. You're gonna confess. And you're gonna practice spiritual disciplines in your life. Yes, this is what it means to be a Christ follower. If you're like, well, do I get to check off some and not the others? No, you'll obey the commands. Like you're gonna see the scriptures go like, I'm so in love with Jesus, I'll do whatever. I'll do, what, if he wants me to die to myself, yes, have it all. There's nothing that I value more than Jesus. But here's this, our internal spirit and our flesh, they battle. And it looks like this, C.S. Lewis said that obedience is the key that opens every door. That's like our spirit. I hope that your spirit this morning is like, yes, I wanna obey because I know that God's gonna open the door. I'm gonna be blessed. I'm gonna walk this out in my life. But then your flesh is like the Woody Allen. It's the heart wants what the heart wants. What's weird is if you understood the beginning, what, what he's talking, you've ever heard this before, right? The heart wants what it wants. You know, you ever said that before? You're like, oh, it's just the heart wants what the heart wants. Woody Allen said that and what he was meaning is he wants to be able to sleep with his adopted daughter. That's, that's what he's referring to. So that kind of lets you know at the beginning where that trail kind of starts. Heart wants what the heart wants. Do you see how nasty that is? How malignant and filthy that is? James 1, 25. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. James isn't saying legalism leads to freedom. He's referring to Jesus who fulfilled the law. He is the fulfillment of the law. We get to look to Jesus intently and say, that's what I wanna be like. I wanna be like Jesus. I'll do what, I'm gonna pursue him. It's like when I was a youth pastor, it was like the most common thing that the students didn't, they asked were not like, how do I know Jesus more? They're like, hey, how far is too far? That was the question that, typical teenagers were asking. You're like, wrong question. But we as Christians, we go to the Bible and like, how far is too far? Like, what can I do that I can still label myself a Christian, live the lifestyle I want, but still be good? That's the wrong question. That's my whole point. And I think that's what James is driving at, to be a doer of the word, to read the word of God and say, yes, that is going to shape my life. And if we don't stop church, if we don't stop as Christians and look at ourselves, just right there in front of us, just take in what we see and say, is this the person that I want to become? Is, am I becoming like Jesus every day with every decision, with every bit of my heart? Because I love him so much. He died for me. I, I love him because he first loved me. If if we're just going after it from that place, then yes, it's awesome. And guess what? We sin all the time. We do. We make mistakes and we sin. But guess what we don't see in the mirror? Our sin and our shame. We've made mistakes. We've turned away. We've all gone astray. We've all cheated on Jesus. And he has stood there the whole time with his arms out welcoming us back in. Because that's how good he is. It's his goodness that leads us to repentance. Don't hear shame. Don't hear condemnation. Don't, don't hear me trying to just steamroll us in this one. I'm saying it and I'm preaching it because the church at large and even us today, we need to hear these messages to help put our spirit into check so we don't just run off and live any kind of lifestyle we want and somehow put a Christian label on it. Everyone, myself included, has to learn to wake up every single day and go, am I becoming more like Jesus from this moment forward? Every decision that I make, is this the call of Jesus in my life? Every time I spend money, every time I proclaim the gospel, every time I use my mouth, every time I do anything in this world, I want to be like Jesus. And there's never a day where I just need a day off from my faith. But every one of us have to stop and realize I may not be living like a Christ follower. Nobody's calling me a little Jesus in this world. Because 2 Corinthians, again, look back at it one more time, and it says this, that we are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. That means ever-increasing. That today, you were going to look back months ago, years ago, and go like, man, I'm a different person today. Years from now, you're going to look back at this person and be like, I had no clue. I just continue to grow. 
Matthew 6, 10 says that your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I thought about, you know, we're talking about artwork and looking at yourself in the mirror. And I thought about, we are a reflection of the kingdom of God. And I thought, I'm gonna show you this picture. It's like the desert and these little round circles that are mirrors in the sand. And I thought, to me, that is a great representation of when God looks at this earth, does he see us as Christ followers reflecting back the kingdom of God? Because God from his places, he looks on the earth and it's dry and it's hard and it's difficult. Does he see the reflection of himself all over this world? Are you a reflection of the kingdom of God? Or are you a reflection of your own flesh and your own disordered desires that have gotten in the way? James 1, 26 through 27, he says, those who consider themselves religious and do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. We're gonna get into what the tongue does. And one of my favorite parts about talking about tongues here in this situation is I love that at the very beginning of the disciples' journey, they received tongues of fire, right? They received the Holy Spirit tongues. They came out and said it looked like tongues coming out. Why? Because we needed a new tongue, right? Because like, sometimes it gets in the way and does things we didn't really want it to do. And we need to recognize the Holy Spirit came like a tongue to change the way that we use our language in this world. And some of us need to go, amen. Not all of you, because some of you are really good at this. I am not. He says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Now, anytime I hear that in the Bible, you would think we better hone in and pay attention, right? Like, let's dial this in. This is what God accepts as a, as a faith and as a religion. He says, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. That means we have a job to do, to serve people, to love people, to encourage and to be there. Man, when someone, a widow or an orphan is in need, we go and do it. I was talking to a family this morning that is choosing to do foster care. You wanna change the world? Sign up for foster care. You wanna change the world? Sign up to adopt. Like that, you, we are going to reach the children. I love that the early church, I remember David Frisch preached a message about this, talking about like people in the Roman Empire, I think it was that they would reject the babies and they aborted them by just throwing them in the streets, but the Christians would scoop them all up and care for them and take them to their homes. And no wonder the Christian population began to expand and grow because they lived so countercultural. You, you wanna do something in the world? Adopt, foster, love, encourage, go visit a widow, love on them. Put your money into to someone that needs some help, that to raising up some orphans. Anything that you can do. And the other part was this, don't be polluted by the world. Recognize what the world is trying to do to us. That might mean we have to actually stop watching things, stop listening to things, stop going and doing the things that are of the world until we can begin, learn how to walk like the mirror that's reflecting the kingdom of heaven everywhere we go. What I'm not saying is to just distance ourselves from the world. Let's go start a little compound and, and, and raise some animals and a farm and we're all just gonna, di no, 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 no. Jesus went into the world. He says to be in the world, but not of the world. We're supposed to be in the world. We're supposed to go and have a hard day because people around us, were not acting like Christians. I don't expect non-Christians and people to behave like a Christian. I expect them to do the opposite, to live like wild people. That gives me every opportunity to share the gospel. But for some reason, we got scared of it. I think we got scared of it because we were afraid it's a slippery slope and I'll start sliding. But no, we get to be strong in the spirit of God, filled with power and authority to go amongst the people of the world and to choose to live so counterculture they take notice and call us little Jesuses. And then Psalm 119, 57 says this. I feel like this is the scripture that is the heart cry of what James is trying to communicate here. I know that James was a man who loved well. Remember, this is the, this is the dude that rejected Jesus his entire young life. And then after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus said, I missed it. But you know what he did? He, go on, he went on to make a huge difference. He no longer looked at the old self, the one that he died and buried with Jesus. He, he recognized himself as being like Jesus. He was now a servant of Jesus Christ. And he said, and I think what he's trying to get at is when he's saying, be a doer of the word. And he's so harsh and he's so like violent with his words that so could stir us up and, and create an anger in us. And just like, how dare we preach stuff like this to the point where we realize we're not preaching just like a, a hostility against something, but we're preaching like just change our heart so that we say, you are my portion, Lord. 
I've promised to obey your words. That is completely different than all of you better get your life in order and start living by these legal rules and Jesus is king. You're like, no, no, listen, there, there's some truth in that, but it so distracts you from the real message of being called into the gospel of salvation and obedience. And we do it because we are so in love with the goodness of God. That is the place that should really help us. So here, listen, this is where the enemy loves to take a message like this and try to, try to twist it, right? He loves to deceive you because you'll hear 95% truth and he'll change that last 5% and be like, did you hear how you were condemned? That is not what the Spirit of God does. The Spirit of God this morning is aligning hearts to fall back in love with Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing today. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have our prayer team. Prayer team, if y'all go ahead and come up here, fill up the front here, wherever they're at. I need you to just see who's gonna be up here because I believe that this morning there's a couple things that are gonna happen. Some of you today have never actually given your life to Jesus and you need to choose today to say, I'm going to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to live according to him. I, I, like, I know you've sat in church for a long time. You've heard message after message and you were waiting for your day. Today's the day. And I know it's you because your heart is racing right now. You're sweating and there's AC is on. And you know that God has been chasing you down, trying to draw you into a relationship with him. And I want you to say yes today. And that's what you're going to do. Whenever it's time, you're going to come down and you're going to tell somebody, I need to give my life to Jesus. I talked to Erica after the first message and she says, hey, I'm going to pray with somebody. She says, well, tell me about your salvation experience. She goes, it was like two minutes ago. And she's like, yes, it's beautiful, guys. We're going to celebrate with you, man. The heavens will just celebrate. Oh, it's going to be amazing. This is what it means. Now, listen, there's going to be some of you who have looked in the mirror of yourself this morning and you look back on your day of salvation. You said, I don't think I'm living the lifestyle that I'm supposed to live. I'm not pursuing Jesus. I don't know if I have a heart for Jesus. I don't know if I'm in love with him, but I want to be. If that's you, I want you to come down and I want you to renew your vows with Jesus today. Sometimes we've gotten our eyes off of him and we started living outside of our faith and living outside of who we wanted to become. And today is your day to say, I'm gonna change everything. That's the beautiful part about repentance. It's a 180 degree turn from what we were doing before. We chose something other than God and we said, I repent and I turn to you and I run home. The minute you turn around, it's like you bump into Jesus. And there's gonna be some of you today, you're like, man, I looked in the mirror and I saw Jesus in my life. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit just encourages you and builds you up. And you know what we need is that third category of people who look in the mirror and say, like, man, I just want to be like Jesus. I need some of you to learn that God has called you into more. That God has called you not to sit in a seat and just receive, but to be a part of the mission of God and to share the gospel, to pray with people, to increase your faith, to grow in your maturity and know, man, maybe I need to be on the prayer team. Maybe I need to start serving. Maybe I need to go to work and start pouring out. If I'm supposed to reflect the kingdom of God, people around me need to experience this. We've got to do something with our faith. And I hope that one of you today hears that, hears that call into the more. There's a deeper calling into our lives. Yes, one of salvation and obedience, but man, God wants to revolutionize your entire world so that people around you come into a saving grace. And wherever you walk, people are just one by one seeing the kingdom all over you. They're seeing Jesus in your eyes and they're being able to respond. So no matter where you're at, you might need to come forward and just pray all on your own. I'm gonna have you stand up. I'm gonna pray over us. I'm gonna ask David. He's one of our elders here. He, I love that David just comes and he'll just worship over us with some keys. Man, he's gonna set the tone for you. The spirit's gonna keep moving. The lights are gonna stay like this. We're gonna give a little bit of time. Man, if you have kids and you need to get them, you can go get them and come right back in here. We'll keep this room open for you. So Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you that your spirit has come today to bring peace and love and joy in our lives, to fill us up with your presence. God, I'm just so thankful that we are in a place, God, that you've honored us with just a strong word, Lord. I thank you for the word of God that calls us into being strong and into being just uh, realizing what you want from us, which is to not be of the world, but God, to be strong and just to be in it, to Lord, to share the gospel, to share Jesus with people we know. And God, I pray for those today that need to give their life to Jesus right now. God, I pray that your spirit would so move in their life, that you would so confirm, open their eyes, open their spiritual eyes so that they can see you today. I pray they're so in love with you that they're going to run down here and just give their life to you. Lord, we just know that it's in a moment. It's not in just a prayer, but God, that it's you in our lives, stirring us up, calling us into that relationship. And I just thank you for all the salvations in Jesus name. Everybody said, amen.